Thomas, how are you doing today? Hey, Ryan. Thanks so much for having me on. Really, really looking forward to the conversation today. Uh, you and I have been exposed in a lot of different Facebook groups and communities that I think uh, have sparked my interest in the whole mergers and acquisitions and business brokerage space of the online communities. So for our listeners, can you just give us a little bit of a backdrop on your background and then how you ended up starting FE? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So little bit about my personal background. Um, if we go all the way back to 2010, I, I was still at college and like many college students trying to find ways to make extra money, stumbled into the world of online business and, uh, and websites. From there, at the time I was doing a, a, a business degree. So I, I always liked the idea of making money and business in general. I didn't have a technical background. I'm not a designer. I'm not a developer or anything like that. But I spotted an opportunity in the industry where you could buy, I guess, badly packaged businesses and improve them to increase the, the value. So I started out buying very small websites, $50, $100, increasing the value of them, either through better presentation or some like slight improvements to the, the business. And then I was reselling them for a profit. So I did that for a little, little bit of time, got quite successful at that, and then launched a an e-course teaching people how to buy and sell businesses for themselves. Like very small businesses, the majority of deals I was doing was say $100 into $1,000. But there was a big demand for that market. I was just finishing. What kind of businesses are, uh, what, sorry to interrupt, what kind of businesses are like 50 to 100 bucks? I mean, what, what is that? Yeah, so back then, I mean, it would have been slightly different market if we go back nearly eight years now. But they would be kind of like template websites. So just starting out, maybe a little bit of content on there. And you, would, you could increase the value by one of the things I used to do was kind of improve the package that was included. So it'd be like, hey, buy this, you get a year of free hosting, you get a SEO guide, you get a marketing mm -hmm. guide, I'll give you a list of contacts, here's some affiliate programs, that kind of thing. So a lot of it wasn't really mm -hmm. doing anything to the business itself. It was packaging it to increase the value. Mm -hmm. um, so that course did quite well, got very popular. It was my first course, so I guess I kind of got lucky. Off the back of that course, a lot of people are like, hey, Thomas, this information is, is great. I really appreciate like you teach me how to sell or how to buy. But what if I don't want to do it myself? Can you just sell for me? So that's how I, I guess accidentally pivoted into the world of M&A and brokerage. This was, so yeah, middle to the end of 2010. From there, that was when FE in its very first iteration was, was born. So we started selling quite small sites for people. And it really just snowballed from there. In 2012, my current business partner, Ismail, who I went to college with, joined. And he had kind of left college. And as many people who do a business degree do, had gone and worked in investment banking. So he had had a pretty successful career there. But I called him one day and said, hey, Ismail, look, I've, I've built this company. I'm great at the great at buying and selling businesses, but I don't know how to run a company. Don't know how to hire people. I'm not good at managing the day to day. Uh, why don't you come come work with me? Let's partner up and build something good. So he joined, kind of turned us into more of a formal M and A service, where applying the knowledge he had learned doing billion dollar transactions to hundred thousand dollar deals, million dollar deals, and then we continued growing from there. We opened an office. Uh, we started out in London, um, and then we continued to grow. And since then, we very much just snowballed, continuing doing bigger and bigger deals, hiring more and more people opening more offices. We now have three in three different countries and three different continents, actually. Um, continue hiring, building out the team. We're now at 28 people, so come a long way in that time. Wow. Um, and now, yeah. for context where we're at, at the moment, we do over 100 deals a year. We've completed over $100 million in transactions. And last year and the year before, we won, well, quite a few awards, but the IBBA, which is the effectively the business broker association in north america mm -hmm. we won their deal maker of the year award um and top producer of the year which means that we sold more businesses verified businesses that is there's lots of people that claim to have sold but can't necessarily prove it um so more businesses than any other broker based in north america and also the most by value so that was wow that's really cool yeah thanks yes. so much so that's one of the things we one last year, and that's really helped us, well, and the year before, and that's helped differentiate us in a space that's still a little bit wild west, particularly as it's focused on online specific businesses rather than, I guess, like traditional offline businesses that have been mm -hmm. bought and sold for hundreds of years or thousands of years. Well, that's crazy. Your, your, your volume is just 
taken off because I mean, every time I see one of your publications or something out there, it was like, it said 60 and then I saw 75 million. So you guys are really, you're really kicking butt out there to, to hit over the hundred. Yeah, absolutely. It's just a case of, I mean, the advantages of building a, a team like we have, uh, it's the business is not me. It's not Ismail. We've got the whole team there who work on the deals and get them through. Um, and the vast majority of weeks we're closing two or three deals varying in size, anywhere from 20, 30,000 on the low end for us up to 10, 20 million is the high end of our range at the moment. Well, and, and in your volume and the, the, the sheer amount of transactions that you see is why I'm excited to talk to you today, because there's a lot of things people do right and wrong. And, you know, as you mentioned in your space, you know, there's a couple firms that kind of do what you do, but it is very, like you said, wild, wild west versus like in the twin cities here, there's the handful of business brokers that have been doing it forever. They've got the kind of the status quo. They post post everything on their websites. And I think you guys are actually pushing them to even fine tune their models because of how professional you guys have become. So I, I think it's pretty cool. And if we can dive into the, your guys' knowledge on what you see that people do right or wrong. Okay. With the businesses that you're, you, know, you, you had talked about, you started in value creation. So I think what are the things that you see people do that are the top ways that they can create value in these online businesses? Yeah, so I think the the first thing that is important to do, maybe this is like a bit of an obvious answer, but it's actually like figure out what you're worth at the moment and like increasing the value. Like how much do you want to in- increase it by? Because there are lots of different things you can do and some of them might involve a fundamental change of business model. Some of them might not. So a lot of the time, a lot of my conversations with people are, your business is great. You're doing really well. Here are a couple of things you should focus on. But the way you're going to increase the value of your business is just by increasing the top line and also the bottom line profitability. Let's speak Mm -hmm. again in 12 months. In other businesses, it may well be that they are quite a long way away from where they want to get to or increasing the value. So they need to do something completely different. So quite a common one in there is, and this, this really applies to any business model, like online, offline, whatever it might be, is building in recurring revenue into uh, the business. Some businesses suit that more than others. So we sell a lot of SaaS, so software businesses with a recurring subscription. Those are always, by their nature, recurring revenue. Um, but often with service-based businesses, for example, they might be a one-time sale. And there are ways you can transition that into maybe having a, a monthly contract instead or a a Mm -hmm. base retainer. So building recurring revenue streams is always a good way to increase value. From a a buy perspective, you've got that. So um, before before you keep going, because I'm sure you've got a bigger list, Mm -hmm. uh, one question I got for you is how many owners know how much their business is worth when they come talk to you? I would say, so if we go back seven years when I started, almost no one, uh, the vast majority of people didn't really have a clue. Um, These days, I mean, we've put a lot of, a lot of my time, a lot of Ismail's time is spent on podcasts like this, going to events, speaking on stages, um, publishing content, whether that's written, audio, video, or, or whatever that might be, educating people about valuation. And we always, we've offered people free valuations for since day one of the company. So people are definitely getting more educated than they, they have been. I'd say the majority of people we deal with now, assuming they actually know their numbers most people have a ballpark idea of what they're worth say plus or minus 50 percent it's quite rare for someone to come in and think or say almost never do people come in and think their business is worth less than we think it's worth and it's quite rare for someone to come in and think their business is worth substantially more so they think their Mm -hmm. million dollar business is worth 10 so my my gut feeling would be plus or minus 50 percent for people who have a business that's at least profitable and would be sellable. And then you get a lot of people who aren't really making anything and have unrealistic expectations. But that's, <laughs> <There's always yeah>. <laughs> that's normally our target market. So I, I don't have enough conversations <laughs> yeah. with those people to know. Well, and what I, what I think is really cool about this, uh, the online businesses that I have found very much unique compared to the traditional Main Street up and down middle market is that a lot of them are built to sell or they've got the intentions in mind and they're doing things a little bit differently because of the education companies and people like you are doing around that versus the mainstream where there is a lot of people that they just don't know. I mean, and it takes a lot more time and due diligence to find a valuation in the mainstream market than it is to do it on on an online basis. Because I think I talked to one of your brokers and, you know, he's only, he only meets one out of every three people he works with in person. 
which is crazy. Yeah, absolutely. So we try and meet as many people as we can. But the nature of the industry, I mean, one of the advantages of an online business is that you can theoretically, most of the time at least, run it from anywhere in the world. So while travel probably 40 weeks a year, we do a lot of events, um, it's still difficult to meet everybody. So let's kind of keep going into your, you know, the value creation drivers that you have, you know, reoccurring revenue is one of them. And I think everybody just yearns after that because of how ridiculously amazing it is, <laughs> just even from an operational standpoint. What are, what are some of the other things that people are doing, you know, as a, you know, you were right, right before you and I um, jumped on the call, you were talking about as a real business starts to form out of this online world, it's, you know, the close to half a million and then you're growing is you're getting more of an infrastructure what else are people doing besides growing the top line and the bottom line and recurring revenue that you see that is really, really working well? Yes, we deal with, I mean, we do a real range of businesses. One of the things that I see quite commonly, particularly with smaller businesses as they've begun to grow, is the most successful and the most valuable companies, but in terms of multiple at least, um, they are extremely process driven and system, system driven with what they do. Um, and that is completely non-reliant on business model. So any business model, you can build a system and process or systems and processes um, around what you do. So that could be everything based on like the tasks as an owner you do every day to systemizing things for your team and, and employees. And those things kind of go hand in hand. If you do a good job of documenting your processes, then when a new employee comes in and joins the team, you can kind of train them much quicker they're going to be much more successful. And then if you, particularly with technical businesses and online businesses in general, often there's lots of ways you can automate through the use of software products or if you hire a developer or if you're a developer yourself, you can often build things in that are going to help automate processes. So they're all things so what that... Are some of, what are some of the examples? Like maybe like come up with a, like maybe an example of a process that someone can systematize? Because there's, I think... You know, there's also the flashy object where there's so many tools and resources out there these days that you can totally distract yourself with putting too many into place. So like, is there certain inside of the business operational processes that you see that work really well to systematize and what, what might be a good example of how someone changed it? You make a good point. There is also over processing and over systemizing things <laughs> where you can get to the stage where, I mean, we had this problem for a while where we had probably 50 different subscriptions for different products on a monthly basis which on their own might be useful products, but when you combine them, it gets very complicated in the day-to-day. So some of the, the, like the better systems and processes I've seen is where people have built out teams that follow the same process on a like consistent basis. One of the most common ones that we see is with content-based businesses. This will usually be businesses that rely on traffic from Google or search engines. Um, and they're generally going to be ad-based or affiliate-based sites. But this can also happen for software companies, e-commerce businesses as well. I've seen some pretty interesting approaches to content marketing where using something like Trello, for example, you can create like an entire calendar of content well in advance of where you want to publish it. And then you can build processes for your team or freelancers or contractors or whoever you're using to go in put together the content, how to research the content, how to write the content, what style to use, and then all the way through to like when it should be published, how it should be formatted, how it should then be distributed. And then these things will tie in with like everything else in your business. So then how does that tie in with your social media? What should you do when a new blog post goes out? What should you do? Should people get emailed? Should it go out on your Twitter account? Does email go before Twitter? And these are all the things that as a business owner, you should test yourself, figure out what works, test different processes, and then put a, a process in place that people can can follow. But without making it too prescriptive, you, you don't want something that mm-hmm. cannot be in any way iterated and no initiative can be used. But I've seen some systems and teams where people, particularly like the owner, has had very little input in content just because they've created such a good system. And their involvement may be like a monthly review of the four or five topics they're going to blog about this month or mm. the hundred articles they're going to publish about different products they can review as an affiliate. So that's a very common, that's a great example. Yeah, it's a very common one I've seen. And there are tools out there like Trello that you can use for free and it's got lots of different integrations. So that's one thing, I guess, side note, 
Mm-hmm. Like you should- no, no, it's a, I think it's a good example because that's one of the easiest ways because it's also tied up, you know, in uh, my business, we adhere to the value builder system or there's other value creation kind of methodologies. And that ties the, that systemiza- systemization ties into the hub and spoke, which is you just everything relying on you, which is so common in so many businesses where you can't do everything and it's not transferable if you're not doing that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I was going to say one of the things with, um, we're talking about having too many products and too many, uh, like systems, uh, like one thing you can do, or one thing we try and do is look for products that have integrations. So look for like, particularly the bigger well-known products will often integrate with lots of others. So even if you have say 20 different subscriptions, you don't necessarily have to log into 20 different accounts can all be in, in one place. So that is one thing mm-hmm. to consider, particularly as you scale. I mean, for us, it's become more of a consideration once we got above 20 people. We found that we, even internally, we had different teams using different products, processes, SaaS kind of services or whatever that might be. Um, and we've tried to consolidate it. So kind of as we grow, it doesn't get too messy. But they're the kind of things that become more of an issue as you scale. When it's just you going to say, hire first two people, the considerations are slightly different. Um, but the mm-hmm. earlier you think about it, I definitely wish when I started out, I kind of put more thought into what we were going to use rather than just signing up to anything that looked good um, and then figuring <laughs> well, out what the end. Well, it's so funny because I, I mean, I love this world that you talk about because I'm, I'm very much the flashy guy. So like, I'll like sign up for everything and then use half the stuff. <laughs> yeah. And like, as I'm trying to over automate stuff, but coming from the mid market space for our old business, it's so the opposite where like you have to go through this huge, which is why they're so antiquated because they have to go through this huge approval process to have any kind of new product. And so you can't be as nimble. So I think, you know, to your point, I think to, you know, premeditate some of that stuff is important, but kind of being able to change on the fly to get the better and be- the better product for the right process is also extremely convenient. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, definitely one of the things that's attracting more and more people into the world of online business as well in that those who come from an offline background kind of have seen the the frustrations and the mm-hmm. kind of negatives and they look at an online business as a kind of thing that ticks a lot of boxes that the offline world doesn't necessarily do well i was uh <laughs> i was showing one of my clients who does the exit planning value building with us uh, a bunch of your listings and this is it might spin off into a good conversation because I was showing him the, the, the pre-tax profit on some of these businesses in correlation to the top gross revenue. And I'm just like, look at this. And I know someone that's got, I mean, I looked at one of your business, I think it was 800 grand in revenue and 500 grand in pre-tax profit. And I just looked at one of my other clients who's got 110 employees, a 30,000 square foot building, 40 cars, all this infrastructure. And here is a, someone online that's got a very, very mature business that's doing the same amount of, of EBITDA. I just was like floored. I'm like, why would you want that risk when this is available? Yeah, no, absolutely. That's definitely one of the other things that people like is the, the profitability, particularly in the smaller businesses where you don't necessarily have to have a huge team to be able to have a huge amount of output, which is primarily down to the fact there's so many products out there that help you kind of scale these things without the need for, you don't need to manually do many things in mm-hmm. an online business assuming you set it up properly, which is like, can make it so much more profitable without the need for a hundred employees. Right. So I, I think if we can continue down the, like the value driver conversation, but maybe we take a different approach to it where when you're looking at these, so the buyers that are coming in, because they're looking for specific things. And I think that is the same thing that these business owners should be doing because you want to marry those two up. So everybody wins, you know, what are the buyers looking for when they're looking through your listings or looking for a business? What are the things that really are attractive where they'll pay more money for it? Yes. I mean, I'd say kind of maybe slightly tricky answer, but it really depends. Everyone has something different they're looking for and different like needs or wants they're trying to fulfill. There's no like one thing. It's not so for example, not everybody is necessarily looking for a business that's extremely profitable. I mean, most people are looking for a business that's growing, looking for a business that's profitable, looking for a business that's in a evergreen space, looking for a business that has recurring revenue, looking for a business where the owner spends two hours a week. So I guess they would be on the wish list for the majority of people. But there's lots of people out there. I mean, we have a pretty deep network now. 
of people looking for all sorts of different things. Some people like buying companies that aren't growing because they're, they have a marketing background and they see the opportunity where the current owner uh, either didn't or didn't have the resources to, to do. Um, so there is, I mean, there is a real range of needs and wants out there. Uh, there's not necessarily like a right or wrong way to like run your business. I mean, ultimately, I always say to people, when you're selling, you only need one buyer. It's not like you're trying to build a business that 10,000 people think is great. That's not necessarily what you need to to do or achieve. So, yeah, you can take all of those standard boxes that most people want, but almost every business, I mean, assuming it has strong fundamentals and it's profitable, someone is going to like that business, or hopefully multiple people. So then there's, uh, I think it's a, it's a good answer that you have because I, I do agree that it depends because you want to have the buyer that's ideal for your the business you bet, bought. So if you're a business owner and you're growing one of these businesses, you know, you got reoccurring revenue, systemizing your operations. What are other things other than, so that way you can enjoy the business at the same time that you knowing or having some sort of idea of who the ultimate buyer might be could change how you build that business. So how, if you're a business owner, how do you marry those two things up, knowing kind of hopefully who you're going to sell to or what type of buyer and what you're doing today? Yes. I mean, I think the key there, going back to what we were talking about earlier about knowing the value, it's also knowing what you would like to achieve. And then that will potentially dictate the kind of buyer you're going to be open to as well. There are some businesses and some strategies that are going to be more suitable to a strategic buyer. So they're only going to be relevant to someone who already knows your industry and wants to buy in that space. My approach with exit planning for clients is work on your business so it is attractive to as wide range of buyers as possible. So you have the highest possibility of a sale rather than, and I know a lot of people kind of prefer this approach, building a business with say three to five buyers in mind, Mm -hmm. um, which can work well. And you hear a lot of people who've had successful exits using that approach. But if you want, so our current success rate for deals we take on is around 95%. If you want a very high certainty of selling your business, then you want to kind of do the basics right and be in a position where as many people as possible want to buy that that business while taking into account that ultimately you do only need one or two people, but you want ultimately a business that someone is going to be motivated to buy. Mm-hmm. Um, strategic buyers, for example, tend to be interested in slightly different deal structures than a financial buyer might be interested in. So quite often in strategic sales, the acquirer wants to keep the, the seller or the seller's on post-sale as employees. A lot of the deals we do, the person who owns the business wants to to leave and they'll usually be transitioned within 30 to 90 days. But that does tend to require a financial buyer who's ultimately looking at the profitability of the business, the growth of the business, the longevity of it, rather than a strategic buyer who's often looking at the value of the the entrepreneur or the business owner Mm -hmm. um, and other things like the value of the customers, what are the customers worth to them, what's the IP worth, what's the IP worth to them, like will they grow their business and this business by combining the two. So lots of different considerations out there. Mm-hmm. Um, but the key is really figuring out like where do you want to get it to because mm-hmm. that really does dictate what you need to be doing. No, I think that's a, a very good point. And um, I, I kind of want to peel apart with your comment about the strategic buyer. What you know, you talked about IP and if most of the businesses are valued on a multiple of seller discretionary earnings or EBITDA or pre-tax, whatever it might be, hovering between three and a four or five times multiple. When you have IP and a strategic sale, I know a lot of that stuff goes through the window in negotiation because you, if you're the seller, you can kind of figure out what it's worth to that strategic buyer. How do you guys handle that on, when you're doing these deals? I mean, is there certain ways that you value IP or value the, the strategy uh, for the strategic buyer? So my, I mean, my general rule of thumb is that IP isn't really worth anything. And it's already baked into the value based on what the business is already making. So you could have the, the trouble with IP and the, the big challenge with IP is a lot of people think because they spend 12 years building something, 10 hours a day, that that is worth, that IP is valuable. Whereas in a buyer's eyes, they don't care if you spent 12 years <laughs> on it or 12 minutes on it, if it's a good product. So a lot of SaaS businesses we see, which tend to be the ones that actually have the IP versus the content or e-commerce businesses, which tend to be usually built on someone else's platform mm-hmm. um, effectively. It doesn't really matter how long that product took to, to build. Often the most simple kind of products and services are the most 
most effective. So IP is very difficult to, to value on its own. So I always say that the value is really baked in by what does the market think? Are people actually paying for this product? If they are, then your IP is valuable. And then, I mean, from a buyer perspective, if you do have a strategic buyer, they may look at it as, hey, what's it going to cost us to replicate this mm-hmm. product? The challenge with that approach is if your business is already profitable, then chances are a multiple of profit is going to be more to you than what they value the IP at. So let, let's say for argument's sake, you're making 100,000 a year net and we use a four times multiple just for like a mm-hmm. reasonably fair average to a $400,000 business. Your IP would have to be worth more than 400,000 or cost the buyer more than 400,000 to replicate. And that 400,000, particularly in 2017, goes quite a long way with developers. So you can get a lot, a lot built for that. And even when you take in like the opportunity cost and the time it's going to take, often the financial buyer is willing to pay a lot more than the mm-hmm. strategic buyer who's only really interested in one thing. So IP is, is ultimately difficult to value. I usually say to people, it's baked into what's there already. Buyers are often willing to pay more or there'd be more buyers interested in buying something unique. But at the same time, there are also a lot of buyers who want something that's relatively simple, built off like a well-known framework. So in the content website space, for example, buyers like a business that's built on a platform like WordPress because there are tens of thousands of people who know how to use WordPress. Mm -hmm. So it's quite simple to run. And in that case, having your own unique platform you've built doesn't necessarily increase the value at all. Could actually, always a lot could of cons- be a detriment to the value. <laughs> Precisely. So there's no real like right or wrong answer to that question. I'd say generally speaking, IP is not really worth anything. It's baked into the the value of uh, yeah. whatever yeah. your customer's already generating. And with the exception of, which is not really something we deal with, like if it's a true IP sale where you have a patent and the target market is say five public companies in that space. But that's a little bit different from what we usually do. Um, so not, really something I know a huge amount about. Mm -hmm. Well, I I like how you articulated that, to be honest, Thomas, because the IP is what allowed you to create that cash flow. So like you said, it's baked in. I mean, it's what allowed you to have a business. Exactly. I mean, that's generally quite an unpopular answer. A lot of people would be like, (laughs) hey, Thomas, that's that's bullshit. Like I did an MBA (laughs) and I I spent five years building this. It's worth millions. Oh, Um, And they may well be right, but um, it's kind of like, it's kind of like in uh, in the mid market uh, main street businesses where like, oh my gosh, you have no idea, dude. I like started out of my garage and I was like, you know, driving a piece of crap car. And it's like, dude, no one cares. <laughs> like, yeah, no one cares how you started true. the business and how long it took you and you mortgage your house. I want to know what did you do the last three years in profit? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll say one thing that I mean, story is somewhat important. I mean, when it comes to selling a company, you want to get on with the person you're buying the business from and vice versa as a seller you want to get on with the the buyer so the story is important um but also as a business owner it's important to realize that like you say ultimately no one really cares that you spent two years eating raymond noodles from your bedroom and making <laughs> yeah. make no money which is like i guess the non-sexy part of entrepreneurship no one really talks about it <laughs> but every entrepreneur has been there and done it um uh, it just true. doesn't just doesn't get talked about because ultimately, no one really cares. That's, uh, um, it that's what make, gives you the war story, if, the war scars, right? And makes you makes you a better person. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, generally, I'm like that crowd tend to be the kind who are selling the entrepreneurship dream to people who are like getting into it, and they'll push past the stuff that's actually difficult in the beginning, where people want to take the shortcut. But it's the same with business buyers as well. They don't really care about what happened before. They just want the end result, which is, I guess, a profitable business. So aside from recurring revenue, systemization, and some of these, what are the, like, the people that are selling? Fa- I mean, it's interesting because, I mean, you guys, that's that's a pretty quick time frame, the 30 days to 60 days for a, bo- a, a seller to, to, to back out after teeing everything up. And that, that proves the systemization. What are some of the things that people are doing well to either make that a clean cut or getting more value for their businesses or other things that you've seen as a common trade? Yeah. So I think one, I guess, fundamental approach that you should have if you want to sell a company or build a company long-term and ultimately everything involved in exit planning should be something that makes your business better on a, on a day-to-day basis. If you're doing exit planning wrong is where you're making decisions that are detrimental to the business or you personally, because you feel like it's going to make the business worth more. Proper exit planning should be increasing the value of your business through through growth generally. So I guess in relation to that, one of the things that's important is making long-term 
decisions. So a lot of people think, oh, if they're going to increase the value of their company, all they need to do is cut the net profit, like cut all their costs, fire all their staff, stop paying for all their subscriptions. Um, and that tends to be quite a short-sighted view. Those who tend to do better and actually build a truly valuable company are one thinking about getting the company to where it needs to be in three years' time, five years' time, or 10 years' time. And that involves a completely different decision uh, in the day-to-day versus a, how do I make the business make as much net profit in the next 90 days? Mm-hmm. Which is one of the challenges with, I guess that creates a challenge for buyers in the market because you need to figure out when you're looking at a business to buy, has that seller been thinking for the long term and putting things in place that are going to make that business thrive in five, 10 years time? Or have they been cutting corners, building a business that's sellable, but in six months time is going to be nothing or decline? So that does create a challenge because you have to figure out if you're dealing with someone who has thought for the long term. Um, and while they may have been thinking about selling in the back of their mind, ultimately they've been making decisions that are good for the long term of the company. And that's really something that increases the value as well. If it's like they've been consistently investing in good people, uh, if they've been consistently investing in good content, good technology, all of those things kind of tie in to make a successful business uh they're not like specific things as such there's no like hard and fast strategy that's going to work mm-hmm. because it really does depend on your business but just thinking long term is important and it's attracts like, buyers like the, i always talk about having like a foot in the you know monthly annual cash flow bucket and then a foot in the value creation bucket because i you know i see a lot where you know whether it's lacking the investment in staff or like in a lot of the customers that I work with where they don't want to hire a president who might cost them over six figures. But that the reality is that, you know, a hundred grand, which is, you know, a hundred, 120, which is a 10 grand a month might actually cost them a multiplier, an entire percent on their overall company value because there's not a, a, a management team in place. So the ca- short time, you know, the, the short cash flow is important, but it's also, you know, like you said, value creation. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a good way to, to look at it. Um, as you know, you, you guys work with a lot of different industry types too, right? The different types of online businesses. If you, can you kind of give us a rundown of the different types and then are there certain specific businesses that you see that are, you know, more, um, available or maybe not available, but more, uh, profitable for the business owner and more valuable when they sell? Yeah. So we break down our target market into three key business models. And then within those business models, I guess there's sub business models or some businesses that might overlap two or maybe even three models. Um, So we primarily focus on SaaS companies, e-commerce companies, and content-based companies. And then like a real kind of mixture within those different industries. In terms of what's like most desirable and what does best, I mean, quite honestly, we have a, a real range and variety of buyers who are looking for like all different sorts of businesses. So we wouldn't necessarily say there's like a popular business model or an unpopular business model as such, particularly if you've done the fundamentals right. Um, and I've been quite conscious as we've been talking to talk about things that anybody can do in any business. You don't have to be a developer. You don't have to be an MBA. You don't have to be a great marketer to do all of these things. They're like basic things, which kind of, I guess, are like might seem boring. They're not like growth hacks or anything like that, but they do work. Um, and often like the most obvious done well are the things that are really going to benefit in the long run. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, in terms of valuation, the businesses we see achieve the most are almost always SaaS companies. And that's really down to the fact that they have that recurring revenue element we spoke about right at the beginning. Buyers like the predictability of a business that has recurring revenue. Mm -hmm. Um, And my view on that has always been that the reason people like that is if they take over the business tomorrow, even if they suck at marketing and suck at operations, assuming the business has been fundamentally built right, that that business is not going to go to zero. It's going to continue making money. So the the risk of losing your money is very low Mm -hmm. versus a company like an e-commerce business, for example. If you run out of stock, you, you're not going to make any money. Fact. Mm-hmm. You, you physically can't. So SaaS businesses are always popular in that respect. Um, and going back to the IP thing as well, I know I said that IP is not worth anything kind of on its own in general terms. But often if you've got a SaaS product, it's probably something quite unique. So in that respect, it's quite defensible. Buyers like that. Um, it, per- it protects the reoccurring revenue that you've got built. Yes, exa- exactly. Exactly. Um, is there things that you've seen, Thomas, uh, that e-commerce or content marketing companies have done to build recurring revenue in 
to their business? Yeah, so e-commerce, like quite a popular one that we've seen uh, recently and sold quite a few over the years is subscription boxes. So charge $50 a month, $100 a month or whatever that might be and send people a box of products in Industry X, whatever that might be on a monthly basis. I guess you could also look at like a model like Gillette or Dollar Shave Club where they make all their money. They sell you something initially, so some initial hardware or software, and then there's a recurring element in there. So with e-commerce, for example, you could charge people for like maintenance, extended warranties are quite common things you see, um, insurance. It could well be that you actually have a product and then you've got a like a back-end club. So people who love your products and use your, your product then pay for a, a membership. If you look at like the much bigger companies out there, Amazon is a great example. I mean, they sell physical products, but they have 80 million subscribers for, <laughs> yeah. for Amazon Prime. So that's so how they've the done world. it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And obviously not every business can launch Amazon Prime and it'd be ignorant to think you can because ultimately people aren't going to pay $50 a month or so $50 a year or whatever Amazon Prime is these days to buy probably once a year from you. Mm -hmm. But there are still ways you can um, put things in there. So for example, the other day I was looking to buy some cat food and there are lots of different companies out there these days offer subscribe and save services where it might be say 50 bucks to buy the product. Or if I sign up for a monthly subscription, it would be a kind of $40 a month. So think about ways you can incentivize people. And it does depend on the product you're selling in an e-commerce business. Some are more suitable, like cat food, for example, is a great one. I want to buy that every single month mm -hmm. uh, and I don't want to have to worry about it. I just want it to get delivered. So signing up for something like that makes a lot of sense. Some products, that doesn't make sense. You might need to look at it in a slightly different way. Or in some businesses, like we spoke about right at the beginning, you might not be able to build recurring revenue. It might make more sense just to keep doing what you're doing and do it really well rather than worrying about building in recurring revenue that doesn't really make sense. Content-based businesses, uh, quite. I mean, content really does vary. So it can be businesses that rely on ad revenue, affiliate income, lead generation income, lots of different things in there. One thing you can do is look for affiliate programs of products that are sold on a subscription basis and then look for ones that will pay you kind of a, a monthly rev share on that. Um, that really will involve some research, but I'd say almost every industry these days has some sort of product in that industry that's sold on a monthly recurring basis. Another thing with content is that the most kind of common recurring revenue in that space is like a membership site. So similar to e-commerce business, you can build like a, a group of people who are really interested in whatever topic you are talking about and then sell them a, a monthly or an annual membership plan. And maybe for that, they get access to premium content. Mm -hmm. So a traditional membership site model. So that's where when we go right back to the beginning, I was talking about figure out where you want to get to because almost every business can pivot into having recurring revenue, but it doesn't necessarily make sense for everybody. And it really depends on your your time horizon. So that's kind of, you need to think about these things kind of all together rather than independently. Well, and really having your customer in mind too. So that way you can make sure that it makes sense for them too, because I think there's a lot of different ways that you can kind of reframe how you're delivering your products and services, but it has to you make, sure, make sure your customer is willing to buy like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like if you're selling trampolines, <laughs> no one wants to buy, no one wants a new color trampoline every week. But when it comes to like clothing or food or anything like that, all of these things work really well on a subscription basis because people are lazy and creatures of habit and want the same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. Have you um, seen any success? Um, I got a couple of ways I want to answer or ask this question. Uh, of people combining some of these business models uh, as long as they've got those same target audience and target customers. So you, you know, have an e-commerce business that you also can combine with a content around that. So that way you could maybe create a membership site and content that you know is a, is a complimentary to your product or service. Yeah, so... Um... I've definitely seen products where someone has sold like an e-commerce, they've had an e-commerce like platform and they've sold a physical product. And then on the back end, they've either had a membership site or perhaps a software product. Quite often hardware and software go hand in hand. So you can sell someone a physical product and then on the back end, they get access to the actual software. So you can mm -hmm. sell a physical product um, and then say $19 a month, you get access to the app mm -hmm. or you get access to the, the, the web app or whatever that might be. So that's quite common to see. In the content space, you quite often see it as like, hey, you're signed up to, I don't know, you're signed up to your website. Let's talk about cats, say. So you're, you like cats. You're signed up 
to their kind of daily or like monthly cat newsletter. You're in a membership site where you learn a lot about kind of looking after them, what to feed them and things like that. And then off the back of that, you can sell physical products to them. Mm -hmm. Um, So quite often you can do a combination and you really should do a combination. And that's where if you have a content based business, affiliate programs could be so powerful to test the business model. So one thing that you can do with a content-based business, if you're promoting, say, the Amazon affiliate program, promote that to your readers or users or listeners or whatever they might be or whatever medium you're using. See what they buy on Amazon, which is very easy to do, and then create and launch a product that is that. It may well be there's a particular product that they're all buying consistently. Or it may even be something like very simple, like you could create a book on the topic that you're writing about, list it on Amazon using CreateSpace, which is something that takes 20 minutes to do, as in once you've written the content, that is. Mm-hmm. Um, and then straight away, you have a physical product you can sell. So there are tons of different ways you can do it. Uh, but it ties back to what you said, like you need to know your audience, but there are ways you can test knowing your audience with things like affiliate programs, see what they're buying already, test their buying habits, um, and all sorts of different things like that. Well, and I think, you know, you, you hit on a bunch of good points, and I truly believe that you kind of almost have to start doing this stuff to be defensive against the Amazons of the world because you have to create raving fans and diehards for your brand based on whatever their interests are. I, I've I, I got a couple of buddies that are in the, the e-commerce space. One of them sell his name or his company's called Fruit Share. So he does a subscription where he it's like a two day delivery from picking to doorstep of fruit. And so you can do the subscription box, but then, you know, you got the Amazon buys whole foods and the whole world, you know, uh, kind of takes a little bit of a notice. Right. And he goes, Oh crap. Now what? But if you, you know, if you can combine that e-commerce subscription with potentially, you know, a whole membership site where people, it's all about healthy living and eating and you got blenders and all this other stuff that you could wrap around it. Now you've got diehards that are not just buying fruit from you. Yeah, exactly. So tons of different ways you can do it. Um, And I agree. I mean, I think if you want to be competitive long term, particularly in the e-commerce space, you need to differentiate yourself for something, someone like Amazon and figure out, like, how can you get ahead? How can you get people kind of loyal, diehard fans? And I guess one of the advantages of running an online based business with the usual lack of overhead that we were talking about, you can build a very profitable business for one person or maybe a couple without you don't need to be at Amazon scale. Mm -hmm. or anywhere near it so you can make a lot of money you only need to make five hundred thousand a year in revenue make 50 percent margins and that's quite a nice living yeah for people that live most places in the world there's i wouldn't suggest moving to to boston but (laughs) there are lots of other places you can live where that's a good living (laughs) three months in you already have a little bit of regret or what Um, so, yeah. so I, uh, you know, as you were talking about building these raving fans and your brands, I think that ties back into your original or one of your original points about every buyer is different. It's because if you're like, if I'm not super interested in a specific topic around this stuff, you don't necessarily want to dive head first into that industry because just of the nature of the interest. Um, so I think that that's a good segue into, you've mentioned financial buyers, you've mentioned you know, strategic buyers, kind of give us a, the spectrum of the different types of buyers, where are they coming from? And then how do you guys go about finding them? Yeah. So I usually categorize buyers into three main categories. Two we've actually just spoken about. So financial buyers and their primary focus is on the underlying financials and profitability of the company and the longevity. Then there's strategic buyers who are still interested in that, but they're probably most interested in how it will benefit or combine with their existing business or businesses. And then maybe some other things in there, like the value of the IP that we spoke about, uh, like the email list, the customer base, uh, various other things in there, depending on the, the buyer. Some strategic buyers as well might actually not really bother what they have already. They might just be interested in a specific business model where they can apply a process they've created. So for example, the content creation process, if you have a good content creation process and team, you could buy any business that relies on new content, regardless of the niche industry or monetization model. And you could probably grow that business just by rolling out Mm -hmm. the, the process. So strategic buyers can kind of be in all different, I guess, walks of life and approaches. And then we have buyers who tend to be I guess, smaller investors or hobbyists who are looking for uh, a hobby. They're looking for additional income. 
they're looking for maybe they've retired and they just want something to do maybe they are working full time and eventually they would like to quit their job maybe they've just moved somewhere and they can't get a job and they want to run a business that group tends to be more interested in like whether they actually like the business financial buyers tend to be more interested in the financials strategics more interested in how much of a good fit is it for their existing models whereas the individual buyers tend to be more interested in like do they like the business Mm -hmm. do they like the owner do they want to run it so those might be slightly less concerned about the underlying financials um, and more worried about like does it look like a good business do they enjoy it so there's the three main categories and then there's overlap between those not every hobbyist is not a financial buyer some some people are strategic but also hobbyists other people are investors but only in a strategic way lots of different types of buyers within there in terms of how we find them so i mean we've been in business for seven years which i guess in the online world is quite a long time (laughs) Um, and in that time we've completed well over 500 transactions so every time we do a deal there's i guess kind of like the network effect like people tell their friends like hey i sold my company and often entrepreneurs or in fact almost every entrepreneur i know hangs around or at least speaks to other entrepreneurs so word does spread quite quickly both in terms of sellers and also buyers so word of mouth is a big one for us um we do do like a lot of content marketing whether that's like podcasts like this again blog posts speaking to reach a real wide range of people so we get a lot of people organically who kind of have seen us or heard us or read about us and come in that way um, and we also advertise businesses we're selling on an anonymous basis on various platforms out there where people are actively looking for businesses for sale and then over time we'll nurture them into someone who's ready to buy often you find with third-party platforms people to look looking to buy on there are either they usually fall into two camps they're either like sharks and they're looking for like a really good deal that can come along every now and then from relatively naive sellers who are like trying to do it themselves or people who are just window shopping like they like the idea of buying a business but they're probably not going to pull the trigger for a while Mm -hmm. so that's where we've invested a lot into content so we can help people who want to buy and they might want to buy we have a lot of people who've been on our list for many years and then two years later they'll they'll buy a business so and you've got some great content i just got to give you props because like i even read your 90 page pdf on how to uh, buy an online business i mean it's just fantastic information regardless of what industry or anything like that i mean you guys have really pump out some very quality stuff yeah i'm glad to hear it thanks for the uh compliments so as we're wrapping up here, Thomas, what is the best way for our listeners to get in touch with you? Yeah, so lots of different ways. If anyone has any like specific questions for me or they just want kind of a off the record opinion, I'm always happy to talk. So my direct email is thomas at feinternational.com. Uh, you can find us on all the main social platforms. So Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram. We're always active or someone in the team is always active and around. Um, And if you're looking for content, then our blog is usually a good place to look. Content either regularly updated on there or a lot we've written in the past. Um, And you can segment it by what you're interested in as well. So do you want to buy a business, sell a business, grow a business? There's a real range in there. And like you mentioned as well, we've got some eBooks as well, which are are worth a read Mm -hmm. if you're kind of in that research phase and you're not necessarily at the stage where you want to chat to us. If there's a, one thing that you want to highlight from all the, I mean, cause we talked uh, about a lot of different things here. Is there one thing you want to highlight or leave our listeners with? What do you think it'd be? Yeah. I mean, I think the main thing for, for business owners is like figure out what you want to achieve and where you get to. There's a lot of like a lot of advice out there. Some of it's very good. Some of it's not so good, but it's all going to be very personal to you. There's no right or wrong answer. You need to figure out what you want to achieve in your business. Some people like working 60 hours a week and they have no interest in putting systems and processes in place. And that that's fine. Other people have a particular number they want to reach or like valuation goal or a time-based goal. Um, so figure out what that is, how realistic it is, and then build a strategy around that because there's certainly not there's multiple ways to achieve your goal. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Thomas. Uh, Awesome advice, and uh, I look forward to talking to you soon. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Thanks for having me on.